Matthew chapter 5. Verse 4, 5, and 6, that is where we'll be at. Welcome to Sangha Bible. My name is Pete. Just so you guys know, if you guys are new here, uh, man, we are our average broken sinners in pursuit of Jesus Christ, in pursuit of a perfect God. And so welcome. Welcome to a broken sinner's church. Um, we are, nobody here is uh, perfect in any way except for uh, Jesus Christ. And so Matthew chapter 5, and it reads like this. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, verse 5, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Church, you and I are called to live holy, distinct lives set apart from the world. So the question is, how do we do that? How do we live a, a holy life in this broken world? How do we live a distinct life in this, this, this messed up world? How do we, where, where can we find this, this blueprint of how to live this life? Well, this is why we're in Matthew. You see, holiness is, is, is a result of a right relationship with Christ. And it comes only because we believe in Jesus Christ and we accept his eternal gift. And by accepting his gift, we are saying we understand our position. He's here, we're down here. But still, how do we begin living holy? Well, the Gospel of Matthew records Jesus' famous sermon. He's on the side of a mountain and he sits on the side of the mountain and, he, and the disciples come to him and Jesus then rolls out how to live this Christian life. He rolls out the, the ways to be distinct in this world. He gives a blueprint, so to speak, to his followers and how to follow details and what it looks like to be holy in this world. And where do you think Jesus begins? He begins with our attitude. Like it's, he begins with our attitude because he knows that our attitude is a direct reflection of our heart. Look at verse three in chapter five. He says, our attitude needs to be humble. Then he says in verse four, our attitude needs to show devastation. Then in verse five, he says, our attitude should be coachable. Then we should be willing in verse six. We should be compassionate in verse seven. Be gracious in verse eight. Be peacemakers in verse nine. And be open to persecution in verse 10. Jesus is laying out the blueprints for his Christians, for his followers to, to follow. And he begins with our attitude. What he's doing and he's calling his people to live righteously. He's calling his people to be righteous. He's calling us to righteousness. And right, that this whole word, it, it means a right way of living. It's the idea of the correct way of living, but not just any kind of way of living, the correct way of living according to God's word and his design. You see, when Christians live according to God's way, we live righteously. We're living correctly in how God wanted. And so Matthew here goes on to record Jesus' sermon in, verse, in chapters 5, 6, and 7 to give us the blueprints, and he begins with our attitude. You see, the religious leaders of the time, they were telling everybody, say, hey, true righteousness is when you stand on the corner of the street and you pray so everybody could see you. True righteousness is everything external. Then Jesus shows up on the scene and was like, no, true righteousness begins internally. It begins in the heart. And then from there, when the heart is connected with the mind and is connected with God, then we live righteously. So he begins with the attitude. Last week we covered verses 1, 2, and 3. And we saw in verse 3, it said, Blessed are, poor, are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed is a happy, fortunate, blissful, joyful are those who are humble. In other words, are those who fully see themselves as sinners. Who fully see they're spiritually broke. They are spiritually bankrupt with no power to do anything. Yet they know they need God. In other words, blessed are those who get it. Blessed are those who understand who God is and who they are. Jesus says they're blessed and the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Today, we're going to cover three verses. Four, five, 
and 6. And if you look at those verses, you're going to see the word blessed is used again in each verse. And in each verse, there is a reward that's connected to the verse. But I want, what I want you guys to see most is how verse 4 builds on verse 3. Verse 5 builds on verse 4. And verse 6 builds on verse 5. And my prayer this whole week for us has been that we would be corrected that we would be challenged and we would be encouraged this week. And if we're corrected in our text today, that we would repent. If we're challenged by our text today, we would respond. And if we're encouraged, that we wouldn't be too prideful to not receive it. So verse 4 is where we'll begin. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Again, the word blessed begins, it's, it, all believers are blessed ultimately because Jesus Christ died on the cross for, for their sins. And they're given a new heart, a new life. And the Holy Spirit now dwells in them. So spiritually, you and I are blessed. We're not blessed based on circumstances. Like after today, when we have a burrito from Crystal Bakery, like hashtag blessed. Like no, we are blessed, period. Because Jesus is our king. He is our Lord. He is our Savior, and we're his children. And so here again, blessed means happy, fortunate, joyful, not based on circumstances, but only because of who? God. So Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now that doesn't make sense to me. Like, what, what's your reaction when you hear that? Like, I, I was a bit confused. Because it, it almost seems like a contradiction, right? Like, what does mourning have to do with blessed, with happiness? What does happiness have to do with mourning? Like, they, 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 well, they don't have anything in common. The word mourn here that's being used is the strongest word to express deep sorrow, a profound grief, a broken heart, a, a deep sobbing, unending tears that comes when, when somebody dies, a loved one dies. It's a... It's desperate. It's, it's a helpless unhappiness. So the text says, blessed are those who have a deep sorrow, who grieve, a, who have a broken heart, who, who, for they would be comforted. It doesn't add up to me. It, it doesn't make sense. Like my question was like, what and who are we supposed to mourn? Like is Jesus talking about the loved ones that passed away? Are we supposed to mourn? Yes, we are. Then is, then is Jesus saying that we're happy, that we're blessed when we mourn the loved ones, for, the, for we will be comforted when that happens? That makes total sense. But it doesn't make sense according to Matthew chapter 5. Side note, when you're reading scripture, you have to make sure that you're reading it within the context of the scripture. And so we can take this verse out and say it. If we were to just take this verse out and completely just dismiss everything else, and we can say it to somebody who, is, who just lost somebody, it would be encouraging to them. Totally be encouraging to them. Be like, God says, blessed are those who mourn. He's going to comfort you. It would be totally encouraging to them. But it would be totally incorrect biblically. That's not why he's used here. It's not the reason what Jesus is saying. Look at just, let's read back from the beginning of verse uh, of chapter 5. Let's read it in its context. Seeing the crowds, he went up onto the mountain and he sat down. His disciples came to him and he opened up his mouth and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Like, it, it, it doesn't make sense that he will talk about the poor in spirit, then all of a sudden he's talking about those who mourn their loved ones. It, it doesn't make sense. It's because that's what Jesus is. Jesus is not talking about that. You see, when Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, he's saying, blessed, happy, fortunate. Uh, those who mourn, those who carry a deep sorrow, who grieve, who are devastated, who have a broken heart over their sins. Jesus is saying, blessed are those who are heartbroken when they break fellowship with God. You see, in verse 3, 
Jesus invited his listeners to an honest assessment of, of, of their heart and their, and their condition. In verse 4, Jesus invites people to, a, to an honest response to their sinful nature. You see, the conviction of sin should always lo- uh, point you to the contrition of sin. You see, what's happening here is because, in verse 3, we understand our sin nature, we are poor in spirit, we are spiritually bankrupt, we can't do anything. Because of verse 3, when we sin, we should mourn. We should grieve. Like our hearts should break when we sin because we're, we're, we're breaking fellowship with God. We're, we're, we're breaking fellowship with God. It, it messes everything up. When we're poor in spirit, when we see who we are compared to God, we will then mourn over our sin. And God says here, Jesus says here that they will be comforted. You see, our comfort comes from Christ. It's, it's embedded in the insurance of our forgiveness. It's embedded in our acceptance by God in Christ. In Revelations chapter 21, verse 4, God promises, man, all the tears are going to be wiped away. But until then, God also promises in Jesus, in John chapter 14, verse 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as this world gives do I give you do I give to you? Let, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The truth is, we do not mourn our sins. We don't. Like seriously, we, 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 we don't grieve our sins. Like we are masters of disguise. Lies flow easily out of our mouths. We suppress, we hide, and we pretend uh, about our sins to the point that it's almost like that's not even really there. Like we, we have talked our minds and, and made our minds up that sins is not really there. And when sin does come out into the light, we make excuses. Like we, we don't make a big deal out of it. We're like, oh, boys will be boys. Oh, it's only a computer screen. They didn't really touch anything. Oh, it's all, we're human. We're all lust. Oh, we say, it's okay. I'm a jerk. That's how God made me. We, we come up with excuses. Church, we cannot accept sin. We cannot accept sin. It's because we don't really see ourselves as poor spirit. It's why we don't mourn our sin. Like, think about it for a minute. When's the last time you sat down and you bawled because you sinned? Really? Not other people's sin, but your sin. God hates sin. And in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 through 19, write that verse down. I'll read it, but... It's pretty clear what God hates here. He says here, there are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deceives, that devices wicked plans, feet that haste, uh, feet that make haste to run to, to evil, a false witness to who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among others. God hates sin. You know why? Because it breaks our relationship between us. It totally breaks our relationship between us and God. When you mess up, when you sin between you and you and a coworker, you and your brother, you and your spouse, you and your parents, when you when you break up, when there's a sin in between you guys, it messes the things up, right? Thanksgiving's gonna be awkward in a couple weeks. You know, like, just things get ish. When we sin, there God stays away from us. He hates sin. He cannot be around sin. And Psalm chapter 5 verse 4 says, For you are not of God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells in God. He cannot be around sin. That's why Jesus Christ died for our lives. That's why Jesus Christ died for us. So that as we sin and we mourn and we ask for forgiveness and we repent, what we're doing is we're submitting to God 
And that's when he comforts us. That's when he comforts us. Verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Do do you see what God's doing and what Jesus is saying, the teaching? Verse 3. Blessed are those who who know who they are. They're poor spiritually. Then verse 4. Blessed are those who are devastated over their sins. They mourn. And then in in chapter in verse 5 here. Blessed are those who are humble. Man, when you know who you are in comparison to God and you mourn over your sins, the only way to live is live with humility. You don't live with pride. And that's why it says blessed are the meek. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean to be meek? Well, the people who are meek, they are confident in the Lord. Psalm 37 is a beautiful psalm. I don't have time to read it. But the psalm is is contrasting the the people who are wicked and evil and the people who trust in the Lord. And so he says in verse 3, trust in the Lord and do good. Commit your way to the Lord and trust him. And then all these other verses, he's like, man, this is the wicked. These are the evil. And then in verse 11, he's pretty much describing the meek. He says, the meek will inherit the Lord, the land. In in other words, the meek are the people who trust and are confident in the Lord. In other words, the meek understand the big picture. They live with perspective. They run with their eyes on Jesus Christ. And so that's why they live humbly. Because they know. They see the big picture. They get it. They know Jesus is going to return. They know that all this is going to be good when Jesus comes back. But until then... They live with humility and gentleness. Uh, Paul describes meekness um, in in the perfect words in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 through 8. He describes Jesus. He says, being in the very nature of God, did not consider quality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he himself, nothing by taking for the nature of God. He made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Meekness is imitating Christ, living with humility, putting others ahead of yourself. Man, when's the last time you've humbled yourself and you did something your kid wants to do? When's, something, when's the last time you've humbled yourself and you did something that your, your co-workers wanted to do? Now, meekness, we can't get this twisted though. Meekness is not weakness. Too many people think that Christians are to be uh, too weak, are, are to be doormats and allow people to walk all over us. I was like, no, 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 no. That's not, that's not, that's not meekness. Meekness is, is strength, but under, the, under control. Meekness is, is trust with confidence. And the way that it rolls out, it rolls out with gentleness. It rolls out with humility. It rolls out with, with mildness. The meekness is, is having the right to do something, is having the power to do something, but you're refraining for the benefit of somebody else. You see, Jesus had the right to do whatever. Jesus had the power to do whatever. But for the, our sake, he refrained. And he submitted to death on the cross. Man, the ultimate meekness. If you want to see a, a, a real life picture of meekness, drive to Oakland and hang out with my dad for a day. Talk about strength under control. Somebody who could probably snap you in half, but it'll be your biggest cheerleader. Probably give you everything. I remember it was my sophomore year. We were playing basketball up north in, in Chico, and it was a playoff game. And um, back then, I, I had hair, and so, so that's how you know God's real. <laughs> I, I, I had hair, and it was braided all the time, so I, I looked like, you know, Bone Thugs in Harmony. And so we're playing up against a, a basketball team, and, and, and Chandra. <laughs> so, so, and so every, and so the, the team we're playing, it, it, it was an all-white team, and, like, they called me the N-word up and down the court. 
you know, the whole game. Just like, oh, get that, get that, and the N-word. And I'm just like, like, I'm barely just like new to America, so like, it wasn't really like offensive to me, but it was just because like, I just, you know, I wanted to fight. So, you know, but I did it. And so, and so they're, they're calling me the N-word, saying all kinds of names. And I remember the game, like, we're done, we lost, and we're just walking back, and my dad's like, we're going in the van, you're not going on the bus. And I'm like, oh, all right, man, I messed up. I didn't fight, you know. I'm thinking that's what my dad wanted to do, you know. Um, and so we, we get into the car, and my dad's, we're waiting, everybody's leaving. I was like, Dad, what are we doing? Come to find out, it, like, he, he knew where the guy that was, like, that started all this, um, he followed him. We followed him to a pizza parlor. And so we follow him to the pizza parlor. And so strength under control, man. Like, you, you guys, if you guys see my dad, yeah, I'm like, I'm like, oh, yeah, we're getting out. Like, my dad, so just so you guys know how strong my dad is, I saw my dad get in a fight when I was four years old. He was playing rugby. He played a whole rug, another rugby team, and he fought the whole rugby team, and about 10 guys are on the ground. And he's the only one standing. And the cops came and were like, hey, who, like, where's the rest of the guys you guys fought? And they're like, oh, they just pointed at him, him alone. That, that's how strong my dad is. So we get out, and you know, we get into the pizza parlor, and, and, he's, and we see them, and he goes in and sits down next to the kid. He says, yeah. And I'm like, oh, yeah, Dad, all right. <laughs> totally thinking. You know, and he sits there, and he's like, hey, you know, you've been calling my son the N-word. And the kid kind of looks confused, and then he sees me behind. And then he has every, you know, his face, like, oh, what did I do? Um, and then, like, my dad says, oh, man, you, you know, my, my son's not black. He's, he's Tongan. He was born in New Zealand. And he kind of gives him a little, you know, a little, little informational, you know, some education on where, where we're from. And, he goes, and then he kind of just talks to him and says, you don't need to be calling people that name. And he was like, you, you don't need to, you know, that, that's, that's, that's in the past. And that, that was wrong then and it's wrong today. Like, you, you don't need to be doing that. Like, you're better than that. And then he gets up and he, and, and he gets up and he pays for their pizza and we leave. And, and I'm sitting there and like part of me was like, dude, we could have like did something, like, you know? No, but I'm like, but like, it's just like, that's the ultimate picture of, of like strength under control. Like if there is ever a time to do something, especially when it comes to race stuff, my dad had the right to do something. He had the power to do it, but he refrained. He stepped back, and he actually came alongside the kid and coached him up. He didn't just tell him, hey, knock it off. He made him better. That's meekness. What does that do? Is that in our lives today? Would, would, if we brought you up here individually and we brought the community you're around and we say, would, would they describe you? Yeah, meekness. You guys blessed those who are meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You guys, we're promised the earth. Abraham was promised land. Now in the New Testament, when Jesus returns, we're, get, we're promised a new heaven and a new earth. We are promised the land, but it's only for the meek. It's only for the meek. Do you see what Jesus is teaching? Blessed is the poor in spirit who sees themselves as a complete sinner. Blessed is the one who mourns over their sins. And from those two things, man, there's no other way to live is to live with humility. Four things I, that would help you live with meekness. Number one, anticipate all the promises from God. Man, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, it says that we have been given an inheritance that can never perish. You, so it can never fade. It is kept in heaven for you and I. So live with such meekness, with meekness, and anticipating the promises of God. So when things come your way, you're like, I'm good. God's promised me an inheritance. Second, take pleasure in the joys of others. Seriously, Take pleasure in the joys of others. We come alongside when people are broken. It's, it's, it's easier. But when people, when good things happen to other people, man, are, are we genuinely joyful with them? Take pleasure in the joys of others. Number three, take time before you form judgments. Man, those who are meek, they listen. And they listen not to respond. They listen to understand. There's a difference. 
They listen. James chapter 1 verse 19 says, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. We need to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger, and quit jumping to conclusions. Because once we jump to conclusions, we live in this atmosphere called assumptions. And then everything just gets worse in the the world of assumptions. To me, it's it's the cleverest thing that Satan's ever created. It's the world of assumptions. Somebody just walks in, and because you live in the world of assumptions, they give you like just the weirdest look, and you're like, oh, she doesn't like me. It's assumptions. We form judgments. It's the, it's the cleverest thing that Satan's created. We need to take time before we form judgments. And lastly, man, the meek remember how much they've been forgiven. And that's why they live you with humility. That's why they live with the humility. Second Peter chapter one, verse nine. Whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he's blinded that having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Man, if you remember how much you have been forgiven, you will grow in meekness. Verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Do you see again how Jesus is building on one another? Blessed are those who know who they are, poor spiritually, who are devastated by their sins. They mourn, they live with humility, and because they live with humility and they know they're poor spiritually, they mourn over their sins, they pursue Jesus Christ. They pursue his righteousness. Like too many times we read this, we read this beatitude and be like, oh yeah, hunger and thirst. But because food is everywhere, because you can get food anywhere at any time of the day, we never hunger and thirst. We don't know what it feels like to hunger and thirst. But in Jesus' day, man, when he said that, everyone knew what it meant to hunger and thirst because everybody is more often than not hungry and thirsty. So when he said it, everyone turned heads. Remember the crowd that Jesus is speaking to. He's speaking to his disciples. But then within the disciples are people who are really interested in Jesus. They're not quite sure, but they're interested. But then outside of those people are the people who just want Jesus for his benefits. And then outside of them are the people against Jesus. So Jesus, when he says this, I'm pretty sure everyone's turning heads. It's like hunger and and, and thirst for the righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Like, how is that going to happen? And remember, he's talking to, to Jewish people, to people who know their scripture. So when he's saying that, all of them are connecting. Oh, Isaiah 55, verse 1 and 2, when God says, Come all who are thirsty, come to the waters, come who have no money, come buy and eat. You will delight in the riches of fair. The people are connecting the dots. Jesus tells them, you guys need to seek Me first. Church, to put it simply, our hunger, our hunger only comes when we understand our spiritual poverty. We'll only be hungry for righteousness when we understand our spiritual poverty. The hard part is, and what I see just in the Christian culture and just in generalizing it is the things that we go after, the things that we pursue, whatever it is that we want, we almost do anything to obtain it. We, we, we make necessary arrangements to get it. We, we will move things physically so we can receive it. Like wh- whatever it is that we want, that we pursue, that we hunger and thirst for, whatever it is, whatever it's on your mind, we always do it the, the most to get it. We'll go to bed late just so we can either stay up to watch a show or we'll, go, we'll get out of bed early. Like we'll, we'll go into debt or, or we'll save. We'll show up early to the things that we want. But when it comes to God and his righteousness, these are the things I hear typically. I'm too tired, Pete. It's too early, Pete. 
I'm like, I'm busy. Pete, I, I don't read. I got to work. And all I hear is excuses and excuses and excuses. Where the God of the universe, who has loved you and I, has sent his son for you and I so that we would believe in him, so that we'd be his children and give us life to the fullest, yet we are messing around with the worldly things here. We would rather take the tickling of the, the worldly desires and dismiss complete satisfaction in God. You guys, we got to hunger and thirst for the Lord and his righteousness like never before. What is one thing in your life that you've hungered for, that you wanted so bad? What's one, that one thing that you, you were willing to do whatever it takes? God wants more than that. We ought to be more than that. We need to be we need to hunger and thirst for the Lord. And when we do, it says that we will be satisfied. It says that we will be filled. In Acts 13, verse 52, it says we'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. In Romans 15, verse 14, it says we'll be filled with knowledge. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19, it says we'll be filled with the fullness of God. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 11, it says we'll be filled with the fruits of righteousness. We will be filled with the Lord, satisfied like never before. What are you seeking? What do you want? And what if we transferred that to the Lord? Do you see what God is doing here? Do you see how Jesus is teaching this? He's saying, happy, fortunate, Joyful, content, satisfied, blessed are those who know who they are. They're poor spiritually, verse 3. They are devastated over their sins, verse 4. They mourn. They live with humility. They are meek, in verse 5. And they desire to pursue Jesus Christ and his righteousness. Do you see what he's doing? He's poking at our attitude. It's more of a jab, if you're to be honest. He's jabbing it, man. Our attitude's got to be different. That sets us apart from this world. That makes us distinct from this world. We are totally holy when we pursue this. You see, too many times we pursue happiness. God's saying, no, pursue holiness. And when we pursue holiness and have this attitude and want to and be, understand that we're poor spiritually, that we're devastated over our sins, that we live with humility and seek Jesus Christ, when we live that way, when we pursue holiness, gets what's right behind it, happiness. You see, we have it twisted. We have it backwards. We pursue happiness. We do everything and we, and we kind of, you know, be like, oh, yeah, holiness, come. We'll use it when, 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 when we need it, when it's convenient. No. Jesus says in these three verses, when you live out those things, when you have those attitude, verse 3, the kingdom is theirs. Verse 4, they shall be comforted. Verse 5, they will gain the earth. And verse 6, they will be satisfied. Church, it's pretty simple. There's no way to land the plane on, on this sermon and be like, I can challenge you. I think we've been challenged enough. What sin do you need to mourn? What area of your life do you need to be humble? And how, where do you need to seek Jesus?